First of all, I'd like to say thank you to everyone at the Today I Have team for this opportunity to participate in the summer school. I think it's a fantastic idea in order to share the experiences and ideas of a range of different people uh, with you. Uh, my name is Ned Dwyer. I'm a consultant with Ranby Consultants and I'm currently based in Lisbon in Portugal. Uh, my background is in the use of satellite imagery for environmental analysis and I worked for many years at the Coastal and Marine Research Centre in uh, University College Cork in Ireland, where I worked on the application of satellite imagery to ocean and coastal issues, uh, as well as working on um, thematics uh, related to, to climate change and climate adaptation. So I'd like to share some of my uh, knowledge and experience and ideas in relation to uh, climate and the oceans. So the title of my presentation is The Ocean Keeps Us Cool in a Warming Climate. But what I'd really like to talk about is what climate change is and how it is occurring. But more importantly, how can we actually play a part in addressing it? So what's going on with our climate? Uh, for many years now, going out back over the last two to three decades, we've seen articles in newspapers, in magazines, on our TV screens, in our, even in our cinemas, talking about the changes in our climate, whether we see these uh, iconic pictures of polar bears on floating pieces of ice, or whether we hear about heat waves or more fires or bigger storms. It just seems to be never ending. But sometimes the way the news is portrayed, it just raises more doubts in our mind and we're not quite sure what to believe. So as someone who has been brought up in a science and engineering background, I turn to the facts and the science in order to understand what's going on. So I think this graphic is a good place to start. What it is showing us is how the temperature of the surface of the Earth has changed over the last 140 years or so. So what we're looking at is how that temperature varies in relation to a, the period of 1951 to 1980. So the scientists have calculated the average annual temperature in the 30 year period 1951 to 1980. And then they have looked at how that temperature has changed since 1880 to the present day. So let's run this animation. So what we're seeing here is that back in the 18, er, late 1800s, early 1900s, the temperature of the Earth's surface was lower than uh, the average temperature in the period 1951 to 80. But as we go through the century and we get to the end of the 20th century and the early part of the 21st century, we see that the Earth's surface is getting warmer and warmer. And when it ends here in the last five years between 2015 and 2019, we see that many parts of the uh, Earth are orange and red. And what this means is that the Earth's surface is between one and two to three degrees warmer than it was during the period 1951 to 1980. And I just draw your attention to the area um, to the north uh, of, of the world along the Arctic. And in fact, we do know that the Arctic is warming up at about twice the rate of the rest of the planet. And this is a cause for concern. We can look at that trend in a different way. Uh, here is a, a simple linear, a uh, simple graph of how the temperature has varied over the last uh, 140 years. So the little grey dots represents the annual average surface temperature of the Earth and how it um, changes with respect to the 1951 to 1980 normal. So zero represents the average temperature of the Earth in the period 1951 to 1980. And uh, the little grey dots represent the annual deviation from that temperature in all the years shown there. But if we just look at the black line, we can see that in the early part of the 1900s, the Earth's temperature was on average slightly lower than it was in the period 1951 to 1980. But towards the end of the 20th century and at the beginning of this century, it has been getting warmer and warmer. And I've just put a red line there on the graphic at 2001. And in fact, 19 of the 20 warmest years have all occurred since 2001. So that means that our Earth is definitely getting warmer as is being observed by these measurements made at different points around the Earth. 
So why is this happening? Um, I'm sure many of you have heard of the, the greenhouse effect. In fact, the greenhouse effect is something that is vital for the survival of life on this planet. Essentially, the greenhouse effect means that there are gases in our atmosphere, such as carbon dioxide, such as methane, and so on, which act like a greenhouse. So they keep the temperature of the Earth warmer than if there was no greenhouse effect there. So it's much colder outside um, in space, um, but these, these gases manage to trap some of the heat inside and keep it in here. However, the problem is, is that as we increase the amount of carbon dioxide and methane and other greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, it's basically acting like a, a thicker greenhouse and it's trapping more and more of the heat um, that is coming uh, originally from the sun inside the atmosphere and it cannot escape. Therefore, the earth itself is warming up beyond what it should be if there was no excess greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So again, scientists have been monitoring the concentration of these various greenhouse gases for many years. And this graphic shows you the observations of carbon dioxide in Hawaii on the blue line and in Macehead in Ireland on the green line. So the, what we see here is that the concentrations of carbon dioxide have been increasing quite steadily since these observations began back in the late 1950s. The little zigzags on both the blue and the green line indicate the seasonality. So what that means is that in the, um, in, the, in the spring and summertime, when the vegetation is growing and the leaves come on the trees and the grass is growing very strongly, all those plants are absorbing more carbon dioxide. Therefore, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere drops a little bit. Then when the winter comes, all those leaves fall off, the grass stops growing. Therefore, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere increases a little bit because it's not being absorbed by the plants. Hence, we get this zigzag pattern. However, if we kind of ignore that pattern, we just see that the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has increased quite dramatically over the last 50 years. And in fact, again, scientists have shown that the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere at the moment is at the, the highest since we've seen in at least 800,000 years. And you may say, well, how do they know? Surely we weren't making measurements 800,000 years ago. That is correct. However, what scientists have done is they have taken cores of ice from ice sheets uh, in the colder parts of the planet where this ice has been being laid down for for centuries and for thousands and thousands of years and when the the water is converting into ice and freezing basically the carbon carbon dioxide is trapped within uh, each layer of ice so the scientists are able to go back and look at the different layers of ice uh, and identify when they were uh, when that ice was formed and within that, they can look at the amount of carbon dioxide molecules that are, uh, are, are there are present. And what this graph is showing is that there has been variation in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere uh, over all these millennia. However, the highest levels uh, seen were around 300 parts per million until the latter part of the 20th century. And you can now see that the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is almost 420 parts per million, which is significantly higher than it has been for um, over 800,000 years. As I said, there's more than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. And these graphs just show you two other greenhouse gases, methane on the left and nitrous oxide on the right. And these observations were made at measuring stations in Ireland as well. Uh, going back to the, the 1980s. And what this shows is that the, uh, the amount or the concentrations of these gases in the atmosphere is increasing. Now, the uh, amounts of these is much lower than carbon dioxide, but the issue is that the, the, what these molecules actually do is they are much more efficient than carbon dioxide of trapping heat inside the atmosphere. So in fact, even though their concentrations are lower, they uh, have a bigger effect in terms of heat trapping. So it is vital that we also reduce these gas emissions. So where do all these excess greenhouse gases come from? 
Um, as I said, we have to have some greenhouse gases in our atmosphere uh, in order to support life here. But the problem is that there's excess greenhouse gases. So where are they coming from? Well, the majority of them are coming from human-induced uh, activities. So 35% of the excess greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is due to energy production. So the generation of electricity, the use of energy in, in refineries, the, the use of energy to produce steel, um, also, the fuels that are burned off when we're uh, drilling for oil is a lot of gas released and this is burned. So all these um, sources related to the production of electricity and energy are causing 35% of the emissions. Another one is industry. So industry consumes lots of fuels to make uh, energy and electricity in order to produce all the, the different products that we use, whether it's cars, whether it's mobile phones, clothing and so on. Also, cement production is a huge user of energy and electricity. So again, um, everything related to construction and buildings produces uh, greenhouse gases. Transport is the third largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions at there shown at about 13%. And this is due to the combustion of oil-based fuels, so petrol and diesel in uh, our cars, our trucks, our buses, some of our trains, for shipping, for air travel, and so on. And then in addition to these three large areas, agriculture, forestry, buildings themselves, and uh, the management of waste all produce greenhouse gases. So all these sources combined are producing these excess greenhouse gases that we see in our, um, in our atmosphere. So for well over a century now, or even a couple of centuries, we've been emitting more and more excess greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So where do they all go? Well, as I said, it's causing uh, excess heating of the Earth's surface, but in fact, only 1% of the heat due to the, the, this global warming is, is, is trapped in the atmosphere. Some is trapped in the uh, continents and the, and the, the land surface, some of it causes the ice to melt, uh, the ice caps and the glaciers. But over 90% of that excess heat from global warming is going into the oceans. So hence the title of this talk that the oceans are keeping us cool. Because if the oceans which cover 70% of the earth were not there, then already this uh, earth we live on would become a furnace and would probably be uninhabitable. Therefore, the oceans have been providing an amazing service quietly and it's really i would say only in recent years that this awareness has grown about the role of oceans in um, trapping all this excess heat but there are consequences for the ocean we cannot say oh well the oceans are sorting out this global warming we don't actually need to worry there are major implications for the ocean itself so I showed you a graph of how the surface temperature of the Earth is increasing. Here is a similar one just for the oceans themselves. The blue line shows you the average temperature between 1971 and 2000 of the uh, sea surface or the ocean surface around the planet. And the um, strong orange line shows you how uh, the temperature has varied around that average temperature um, over the last 140 years. So again, uh, at the end of the 1800s, uh, beginning of the 1900s, the ocean temperature was about one degree lower than it was in the period 71 to 2000. But then we see all through the 1960s, 80s, into 2000 and up until the present day, the temperature of the ocean has been increasing. And in fact, today it is one to one and a half degrees warmer than it was at the beginning of the century. So what are the implications of this? Well, the fact we've seen that the uh, ice is melting as, as, as the heat from these excess greenhouse gases goes in, into the, the ice caps, whether it's in the Arctic, the Antarctic, or on uh, glaciers on land. Therefore, that's releasing fresh water into the oceans. In addition, as we heat up water, it actually expands. Therefore, the water in the oceans is taking up more space than it was before. This means that the sea levels themselves are rising. And in fact, we've seen more than 20 centimeters of sea level rise over the last 100, 120 years. And this black, this graph here shows you how that sea level has risen on average 
across the world uh, since 1880. And again, you see that it's a pretty inexorable rise. And as I said, more than 20 centimeters uh, over the last hundred or so years. Other problems that the ocean is facing due to the excess heat being trapped, and remember I said 90% of this excess heat is going into the oceans. Uh, we hear uh, almost every year about the Great Barrier Reef in Australia suffering due to coral bleaching. And what that means is that the coral lives a symbiotic relationship with algae uh, to give us the beautiful co uh, colors and structures that we have in uh, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, but not only, also in parts of the Indian Ocean and the Caribbean and so on. But as the temperature of the water increases, this puts stress on the coral itself and on the bacteria that they, they live together with. These ba bacteria are algae, they, they move out of the coral and the coral can't survive. Therefore, it's bleached, which means it turns white and essentially dies. So this ever increasing uh, water temperature is really stressing the coral. But in addition, we have pollution in, in some, some parts of the world as well. Our actual sunlight itself is, uh, is too strong for the, for the coral. So all these issues are causing the, the coral to bleach. And uh, in Australia, we've seen that there's been major bleaching events over the last number of years with vast areas of coral suffering. So these are some of the effects due to the excess heat that the uh, ocean is taking up. But another issue that uh, the ocean is facing is the fact that the carbon dioxide being emitted from all the human uh, made sources, some of that actually comes out of the atmosphere and goes into the ocean uh, and forms a weak acid called carbonic acid. So the carbon dioxide itself dissolves in the ocean water to form this carbonic acid. And as you will remember from school, an acid is a corrosive substance. And the, this means that the ocean itself is becoming more acidic. And this has implications for different types of uh, life that, that live in the ocean. In particular, for shellfish and species that, that make shells or, or skeletons. So corals themselves and all sorts of shellfish cannot form their shells to the same effect because essentially they're living in a more acidic envi environment and that acid is corroding away the shells. Therefore, um, what this means is that there's big implications for the bottom of the food chain because other creatures, bigger fish and animals, uh, live on the, the shellfish and, and, and other species at the bottom of the food chain which are affected by the acidification. Therefore, there's knock-on effects uh, all through the, the ocean ecosystem. Another challenge that is uh, being faced by the ocean uh, with this increased warming is the, the movement of species. And many ocean species are migrating due to the changes in the ocean conditions. And this small little study uh, taken to the north of Norway uh, illustrates that. So in 2004, this survey was carried out and it identified areas of uh, what they called Atlantic fishes, central fishes and Arctic fishes. When they went back in 2012, which is shown on the, the right hand side, they saw that the Atlantic fish were now pushing further north because as the waters are warming up, those fish are able to live a little bit further north. But what we note here is that the Arctic fish are really being squeezed out. So the area in which they found the Arctic fish is got very small because the, the, the cold water that these fish need is no longer available to them. The area is warming up and to the north of those fish, you're, you're getting into the ice caps of the Arctic where even the Arctic fish find it hard to survive. So therefore this migration is causing a, a change in the, the um, ecosystem distribution. So it's not only changes in such distributions, but what we also see is that invasive species are now moving into areas where they couldn't survive before. And these are eliminating native species that are not, not able to deal with them. So one big problem we've seen uh, is with jellyfish. So jellyfish now are appearing in, in bigger numbers and in different parts of the world. It's not completely understood why this is. Um, it's partly due to the, the warming of the ocean, but not exclusively. It may be that some of their predator numbers are reducing uh, as well, and also changes in ocean currents 
and so on. But it is proving to be a big issue. And even here in Portugal, we had our local beaches closed um, in August of this year uh, because of uh, jellyfish uh, appearing on the beaches. And this is a very rare occurrence as these jellyfish usually appear in the autumn and winter. Um, other invasive species, and sometimes these are, are released from aquariums, such as these lionfish, which are a, a, a tropical species, but are now found in the Mediterranean and other uh, bodies of water. And they are very voracious and they have no known predators in these, uh, in these sea basins. Therefore, they pretty much take over and they can really completely ruin an ecosystem. As well as these various uh, fish species, um, there's also issues in relation to plants. So we get growth of um, certain seaweed species uh, or, or extra algal blooms growing, uh, such as these, uh, this sargassum, which is shown here. And essentially what happens is that you get uh, this excessive bloom of, of, of seaweed or uh, algae, and it removes the oxygen from the water and it can cause other species to die as well. So these changes due to the, the changing temperatures and acidity and constitution of the ocean are having major effects on the ecosystems there. I referred earlier to uh, the fact that sea levels are rising and that we've seen over 20 centimeters of sea level rise over the, the last century or so. So I just thought I would zoom in here on the uh, Baltic Sea near Gdansk and look at what would happen if the sea levels continue to rise. So this is the current situation. Um, at the bottom of the screen you see the global temperature rise uh, graphic and this is showing the situation at the moment. Now if we increased the temperature of the earth by approximately one degree more that causes a two meter rise in sea level and the blue areas here south of Gdansk are showing you the area that will be inundated if there's no coastal protection put in place. We also see to the northeast uh, there that there's also inundation from from the ocean. If we continue to uh, warm the earth further so here as a, a two degree rise of global temperature, we're getting an almost five meter rise in sea level without any coastal protection. And larger areas south of Gdansk and near the, the north uh, west coast there are flooded. And of course, the situation gets worse as we go to a three degree um, temperature increase or even a four degree temperature increase. So uh, let's hope that we never get to this situation because the effects will be dramatic. This is showing you the situation for one small city, such as Gdansk, but more than 50% of the global population lives along the coast and many of those in mega cities. So the challenge we have um, as sea levels continue to rise in protecting our population and major centers of uh, economic growth um, is, is, is huge. So I have shown you the issue of, of what is climate change, why it's occurring, um, but now I would like to move and talk a little bit about how can we actually reduce and manage some of the impacts of climate change. So this graphic is showing you uh, that, that a model essentially where at the top we have the greenhouse gases which cause the climate change. These ch changes have impacts as we've seen and we have to respond to those impacts in different ways. The two uh, ways that are, are known that we can respond to these are, first of all, mitigation, which essentially means we need to reduce and eliminate the greenhouse gas, excess greenhouse gases that we are emitting um, as humans. And the second is that um, these impacts are happening anyway, so we also have to adapt how we live with them. So we'll now look a little bit in those, at those two issues. There's been scientists and politicians meeting for many, many years in order to address the issue of climate change. It's not something that we just suddenly discovered a few years ago. It was already on the agenda 25, 30 years ago. However, progress has been slow at the political level. But in 2015 in Paris, I would say a major step forward has been taken by politicians and nations in general, where there was a global commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And the Paris Agreement said that the objective was to hold the increase in the global average temperature to well below 2 degrees Celsius 
above pre-industrial levels and to pursue efforts to limit the increase to one and a half degrees Celsius. So this is in fact a huge political commitment um, because what was seen and the scientists have demonstrated this is that if the average global temperature increases by two degrees, then we're entering into areas where the, the survival of ourselves and many species on the planet will become extremely challenging. Therefore, it's in our own interest, I would say, uh, to address this and to ensure that we do not reach these uh, tipping points, as they're called. So let's remind ourselves again of where all these excess greenhouse gases are coming from. We've seen that uh, the production of energy is uh, one of the main sources, and then in various industrial processes and transport are three of the big areas that will have to be addressed, but not exclusively. And um, we have to reduce our greenhouse gas em emissions uh, as a, 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 a as planet essentially. And in Europe, the European Commission has uh, basically enshrined in its policy the goal to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions significantly. And this is showing you the, the pathway that they have uh, put in place in order to have those minimized by 2050, which in fact is only 30 years away. So again, if we just look at these three big emitters, uh, power, industry and transport, we see there and it's highlighted in the, the red circle that around 2005, they really contributed most of the greenhouse gases. And you see that the, the, the plan is in order to reduce those significantly by 2050. So that is an absolutely huge challenge we have to address. But we have to do it, and there's a push from civil society and citizens in general to decarbonize our economy. And we've seen uh, the protests um, over the last year in particular. Um, on Friday, schools were going out to protest about climate change. So I think this awareness among uh, more and more people um, is rising, and there's now a really big push from citizens in general to decarbonize our economy, which is putting pressure on our politicians and decision makers to actually do something about it. So as energy is one of the, the major emitters of greenhouse gases, we really have to remove carbon from that. And here are some of the options we have for renewable energy generation. We have uh, solar energy, which um, obviously is, is using photovoltaic cells in order to capture the energy from the sun itself. And um, one of the biggest solar arrays are installed in Morocco at the moment. As you can imagine, it's an area which gets a lot of sunshine. The wind farms um, have been proliferating, I would say, over the last 20 years. We now see wind uh, generators on the top of hills in, in many places. And in some countries such as Denmark and uh, Germany, a lot of wind farms are also being placed at sea um, which is a great place to capture the wind. Um, biomass, uh, which means that we're using grasses and timber in order to generate energy. And this is carbon neutral because as the trees grow, they're capturing the carbon. And then when they're, they're burned or consumed to generate the biofuels and uh, biopower, then that is released again, but it's not additional carbon. Um, hydrogen is known as a source of fuel and there's been a lot of research done for many years now on uh, fuel cells for, for hydrogen and in fact there's been a huge investment by the European Union just quite recently in pushing forward research in this area but still there's a long way to go before hydrogen becomes a significant source of energy. Some countries such as Iceland uh, rely almost exclusively on geothermal energy which is energy coming from the below the, the earth's surface itself and uh, in places like Iceland, this is used to generate power plants and for circulating heat around communities. Uh, it's still, I would say, a relatively small contributor. The ocean, as I said, covers 70% of the Earth, so obviously it's a great place to look for energy. We just have to look at the waves that uh, crash on, on our shores every day. And there are devices to capture the uh, power from tides and from waves and from the heat of the ocean itself. Um, there's still many challenges to overcome here in order to make uh, power generation devices of, of uh, big enough size in order to generate the amounts of power that we need. Hydropower has been used for many years where we are capturing the, uh, the, 
the energy in, in river systems themselves uh, to generate electricity. But the one that's missing from this is uh, nuclear energy, uh, which is uh, rather controversial due to some of the accidents that have occurred. But some countries, such as France, generate the majority of their energy uh, from nuclear sources. Now, when we look across this array of renewable energy sources, none of them come, uh, I would say, without a price of some sort. Uh, wind energy, for example, there's been a lot of challenges to wind uh, farms. They're seen as intrusive in the landscape. Sometimes they've caused landslides. When they're in the ocean, they can interfere with fisheries, with uh, boating, with um, ferry boats, uh, and with the ecosystem itself. And we can go through each one of these and see that none of them uh, don't come without some sort of problems. So as a society, we have to look at what are the trade-offs that we're trying to meet here. If we insist on consuming the amount of energy and even more than we do today, then this energy has to come from somewhere. So what is the most appropriate source? However, I think we have to be very careful that in solving the uh, climate change issue, we don't um, create other problems that we will then have to try and solve in the future. So we need to do this in a very, I would say, intelligent way. In relation to transport, we saw that it was uh, producing at least 13% of the excess greenhouse gases. So the choices that uh, we make as citizens and countries in relation to transport are important. And this graph is showing us the grams of carbon dioxide per passenger per kilometer. Obviously, walking and cycling uh, produces the least amount of um, greenhouse gases, essentially none. Then, as we look at trains and buses, uh, motorbikes, the amount of greenhouse gases increases. Uh, private transport, such as cars and trucks, um, generate quite a lot. And then uh, air travel produces a significant amount of, uh, carbon, of carbon dioxide um, per passenger per kilometre. So even though the contribution of uh, aircraft in general to the full array of greenhouse gases may be uh, quite small and is estimated around 2%, when we look at it at a per person per kilometre basis, it's absolutely huge. So in addressing this, uh, we need to think about how can we change uh, our transport choices. So there's been a big push towards electric vehicles, which means that we are um, getting rid of the need for petrol and diesel in our cars and trucks and uh, buses. So some countries have been making great progress in this area. Norway has almost half of its fleet of vehicles now as uh, electric vehicles. And this has been achieved by government policy, which is putting in place incentives for people to uh, choose electric vehicles and also putting the infrastructure in place across the country so that people can recharge their vehicles. And then as we see other countries also have uh, been adopting um, electric vehicles but to uh, a much smaller extent so far. However, when we do uh, move towards electric vehicles, it's vital that the energy that we're putting into them is coming from sustainable sources and not from fossil fuels. So we just have to be careful not to move the problem to somewhere else. So what I believe is that we need a new model for our economy. It's not just that we need some sort of quick fix for the climate change issue. We need to look at how our economy is working in general and if there's a better way uh, than what we've been doing for the last century or so. And what have we been doing? We've been looking at this inexorable growth uh, type of economy, which is based on, um, I would say, disposal. Essentially, we take raw materials, we make some product from that, we use it for a while, we then dispose of it, and this, this uh, disposing causes major pollution. And then we go back and we take again. So it's as if we, can, we want to take raw materials forever and then just throw them away. So this is the way we've built our economy so far. But it's time for a change. And one possible model that can be looked at is the circular economy, where we do make something, we use it, but then we reuse it or we remake it into something else, or we recycle it into something else. So the idea is that we conceive our economy uh, in a circular fashion, in that we're reusing, reusing, remaking all the primary products that uh, we're taking, because the earth only has so many resources uh, to use, and uh, we need to 
really look at how we can maximize the, the effectiveness of how we use these. This idea of circular economy is also taken up in the European Green Deal. And uh, the European Green Deal uh, was published quite recently, and it's looking very much at how can the economic growth of Europe be founded on, a, a, let's say, the idea, idea of a, a green future. I don't intend to go through this in, in any detail. Um, it's a hugely challenging plan and uh, it covers issues of uh, climate change shown up there on the, the, the top left. Um, it's also looking at how we generate our energy in a more secure way and affordable way. Um, also looking uh, at making industry adopt the circular economy as I referred to, um, looking at how we can improve our buildings looking at better ways of, of mobility and transport, um, also in relation to food and biodiversity. So the I think the good thing about the European Green Deal is that it's looking at all these issues together and not just as uh, individual issues to be solved, because it is only by looking at the issues as a whole that we can um, develop a smarter economy and one that is not having as much impact on the planet. So governments are beginning to react and actually put policies in place. Uh, I would call this the top-down approach. However, there is also the need for bottom-up action. So we as citizens can actually have a role to play. We can't just sit back and say, okay, the government will sort it out. I don't need to do anything. The only way we are going to solve this problem uh, in relation to climate change is by addressing it together. So, as individuals, we also need to think about how can we reduce our carbon footprint. I like this graphic because I think it brings together many ideas and can give us uh, also ourselves ideas for what we can do as individuals. So, if we start up here at the left on this green branch of the, the tree, it says be a catalyst. So it says yourself, kind of be strong, force yourself to be, to make the changes, but also go out and talk to others, talk to your family, to your friends, to your work school, make them aware of uh, what's happening in terms of global warming. So hopefully I've given you a few ideas already to help you to share with those colleagues and with those um, friends. Also, what's important is that your vote counts. Uh, as I said, there is movement uh, politically to make change, but I would say it's still quite slow. So when you do have the opportunity to vote in your local elections or national elections or European elections, uh, make sure that you're voting for people that understand the need to address climate change. Um, and also try and talk to these representatives in order to get um, across the, the importance of dealing with this. So I would say changing minds is definitely one of the most important things we can do. But then ourselves, we need to demonstrate that we're not just all talk, but we're able to act. So when it comes to traveling, we should look at the, the ways we travel and see if there's a, a more sustainable way of doing that. Can we walk a little bit more? Do we always have to take the car? Why don't I buy a, an electric car the next time I have to change my car? Do I really need to fly? Sometimes perhaps you do, but perhaps you can eliminate some of the flights you have been taking. So it's really to look at these options and see yourself, how can you reduce um, the amount of carbon you're consuming? In your home, you can look across all the different rooms in your home and get some ideas. Make sure that your light bulbs are renewable um, and energy efficient. Um, make sure your appliances are, are, are working effectively. Turn things off when you're not using them. Um, if you happen to be lucky enough to live in a place that has plenty of sunshine, hang the clothes out to dry. Don't be using a dryer. Um, you may also have the possibility of installing solar water heating or solar power panels on your the roof of your house. Investigate that. And I would say, importantly, make sure the insulation of your house is as good as possible. Also in relation to food, look at buying local food, not food that has traveled thousands of kilometers. Um, use uh, renewable packaging where possible. Um, also consider what you're eating. Um, beef has been implicated recently as a major cons uh, contributor to greenhouse gases. So think about the uh, amount of meat you eat and do you really need to eat that much? And, uh, and just look at, I would say, balancing 
uh, the things you do. So it's not that you have to do everything on this, but I would say try and see how you can introduce these changes into your own life. And if you're struggling for ideas, I would recommend to you this book that's been uh, recently uh, published by a friend of mine, uh, Tara Shine, um, uh, in Ireland. And what she does is gives uh, very practical ideas on how we can improve the planet in terms of not only climate change, but sustainability in general. And if you go to the website shown here below, Change by Degrees, you can find out more about the book and also get some ideas on what you can do uh, in your own home. So some practical steps that uh, Tara gives in her book is, for example, in relation to your, um, to your garden, for example, is to buy peat-free compost, uh, try and avoid, avoid using weed killers um, and insecticides, make sure you don't throw old paint down th the drain, um, also don't put your dog waste into the compost, and check out if the cat litter you're using is natural or is it made out of some sort of plastic. So these are the things you could become aware of. Then in terms of your office, um, make sure you're turning off your computer and other equipment. Uh, maybe you could do more remote working, although in this post-COVID world, maybe you actually want to do more office working because you'd like to see your colleagues now and again. But um, I think there is an opportunity to uh, mix this up. Maybe in your office, you can look at being more sustainable and work that out with your colleagues how to do that and uh, educate your staff about that um, and get outdoors a bit more. These are all, I think, good things you can do. So we've talked a little bit about mitigating climate change, the absolutely vital need to decarbonize as soon as possible. However, I also indicated that there are already many impacts um, happening because of climate change, whether it is rising sea level or whether it's the heat waves or more intense storms. So we have to do something about that today. We can't just turn off the tap on greenhouse gases and say it'll be all okay. So some of the things we see along our coastline in particular is the roads often are eroding away due to big storms. Um, in some places, houses are actually falling into the sea because of erosion. And as I said earlier, many of our towns and cities are on coastal areas. And when we have storms and hurricanes and uh, uh, flooding events, then these areas are inundated and can cause widespread death and hardship for literally millions of people. So we have to actually adapt to climate change. This is a vital thing we have to be doing today, even if we stop putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So in terms of the coast again, sometimes we have to use what are called hard engineering solutions. So for example, here to protect this piece of coast, we have to put concrete structures in place. Also here, we have to protect the beach with some sort of um, uh, strong structures. And in some places, we really need to uh, build walls um, in order to protect the coastline. But working with nature is also uh, an option in some places. So sowing grasses to protect sand dunes. Uh, also in the tropics, um, there's uh, a lot of areas of mangroves which have been removed over the years. And mangroves are great at protecting coast coasts from storms and inundation. And they're also nurseries for many fish species. So it's great to see some of those coming back. And in fact, beach nourishment takes pl place in many um, countries where we actually put sand back on the beach to try and protect the coastline. We could also look at learning from traditional approaches. Uh, many uh, communities that live in, in areas where there's a lot of water have put their house on stilts. And uh, we tend not to have done that in more recent times, but it is something we could think about uh, for future developments if we do want to live um, along the coastline and in areas which are prone to flooding. So that's only to give you a taste of um, the idea that we have to adapt to climate change in many, many different ways. Um, but as I said earlier, as a society, we have to decarbonize as quickly as possible. We just have to turn off this tap of excess greenhouse gases. However, at the same time, we need to adapt in many ways to manage these inevitable uh, changes to our climate because the ocean will not be able to keep us cool forever. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope that you've uh, learned something from the, this presentation. So the, today I have team provided me with some questions that came in in regards to my talk, and the first one of, of 
these questions was, what is more important, mitigation or adaptation to climate change are, are both equally important? Well, I hope after the presentation, I've demonstrated that both are equally important. We have to decarbonize as rapidly as possible. However, even if we stop emitting carbon tomorrow, many changes are already taking place to our climate and are having major impacts. Therefore, we have to adapt at the same time. I really like the second question is, how do I talk to my grandma about the need for changing our lifestyles? Well, I think uh, we could change grandma to my brother, sister, mother, school friend, um, politician. There's many people out there that don't uh, see the need to change our lifestyles. So I think in relation to your grandma, I wouldn't give her a lecture um, because it can be very alienating and it can be seen as very challenging. However, I would look at maybe what grandma does and, and how you could maybe help her to make small changes. So perhaps when she goes to the supermarket or do her shopping, you could um, buy her some reusable bags and make sure she uses these so she's not bringing back more and more plastic each day. And then use this as an opportunity to say why you, uh, you, you believe this is important. Again, um, in the shopping, you could encourage going to a local market or you could look at where the products come from. For example, uh, recently in Ireland, uh, I was doing the shopping and I saw that the peas and beans were coming from Zimbabwe. This is kind of crazy because we can grow peas and beans in Ireland, but because of the type of economy we have, it's cheaper to have them produced in Zimbabwe and flown to Ireland, which is crazy from uh, many perspectives. So again, maybe having that discussion with your, your grandmother. Also, perhaps your grandma loves to, to work in the garden, so you could encourage her to uh, install a compost heap or to stop using uh, insecticides or weed killers. So I would say really work with your, your grandma or whomever it is to see what is it that makes them tick, what excites them, and where can you actually help them to make practical changes? I think this is the best approach. The third question here was, are there any hints on how best to promote sustainability? Well, in this talk, I've, I've given you some ideas on looking at sustainability, whether it's in relation to how you, you eat food in your home, uh, in your transport and so on. But this question seems to be more about promotion. So the first thing I would say is you be the agent of change. You have to demonstrate yourself that you are leading a more sustainable lifestyle. And then I think in terms of promotion, if you're uh, going to school or working in a school, perhaps you can organize a talk in relation to sustainability or a workshop and uh, get the students and your colleagues, the staff to work together on coming up with ideas for making a more sustainable school. Or if in your work environment, you think there's opportunities for sustainability, then perhaps bring it up um, when there's an occasion to look at how you could be more sustainable. And maybe again, just one step at a time. So it might be that um, all the reports are always printed in duplicate and you could say, well, do we really need to do this? We could just um, distribute them electronically. So I would say start small. Um, another thing is look for, for organizations in your town or in your country which are working on sustainability and join those because I would say that will give you a lot more enthusiasm and the ability to, to make changes, share ideas, because sometimes we feel we're on, we're, uh, alone on this but there are actually many many people out there that think the same as us in terms of the need to uh, develop a more sustainable approach to how we live therefore join these groups and share your ideas and get new ideas and then move them around within your your um, community the last question i have here is the um, possible covid19 second wave is showing how being aware is not enough to convince some people to change behaviors we never spoke so much about the planet, the climate, the ocean. Ocean literacy is a very trendy topic. What else do we need to put in practice to have a stronger, united reply from society? Well, on that regard, I think there's always skeptics. So uh, whether it's COVID-19, whether it's climate change itself, there are people out there which says, no, it's a conspiracy, it's a lie, it's not happening. We're being lied to. The scientists are uh, telling us falsities. This, I think, is inevitable in almost all topics, and it is becoming a bigger challenge with social media and other ways of communicating. However, we just have to resist this. We, there are so many people out there that are, are, are making actions and, and doing good. 
And um, in terms of the united reply from society, I don't think we'll ever achieve a completely united reply. However, I think we have to just keep doing what we're doing. There's so many organizations and groups out there which are pushing for um, a more sustainable uh, world, uh, for improving our oceans, for reducing climate change. Uh, we've seen um, the uh, various student strikes over the last year or so. So I think this is really raising awareness. So again, it comes back to you operating within your environment, whether it's in a school, in a work environment, in your local community, to help catalyze that change. So I would say you keep contributing to it. Try not to be um, demoralized by these naysayers or those who deny that these things are happening because you know better, they are. So you just have to join with like-minded people and do the little that you can do to make the change. So thank you very much for all your questions.